Good morning guys, I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to go over Physics 1, Chapter 1, Physics and Measurements. This is going to be a brief rundown of what is said in Chapter 1. And so let's get right into it. So, first of all, um, the first part of Chapter 1 discusses measurements. So, in 1960, an international committee established a set of standards for fundamental quantities of science. It is called Système International, which is French for International System. And so we usually call this SI, and you're going to hear this a lot in your physics course. And so these, um, the fundamental units of length the, this organization basically pinpointed um, a number of units to describe um, length, mass, time, among different uh, a number of other different types of measurements. So for length, whenever we talk about length, so like the distance, distance, we're going to be dealing with meters which we abbreviate, abbreviate with M. Whenever we deal with mass, which is, um, which is basically the quantity of matter, I guess this is a good like image to show what it is. And so whenever we deal with mass, because we're working in the SI units, we're gonna be working with kilograms. And as for time, So I guess I can put a little clock here. That's a really bad clock. <laughs> Let's put like nine, three, six, twelve. That's a clock. <laughs> Whatever dealing with dealing with time, we will be working in seconds. And so there are a number of other measurements, such as temperature which the SI for which the SI unit would be Kelvin but we're not going to deal with that in this class at least for these first few chapters so let's just erase that so with these three units we can basically um, with all quantities and mechanics can be measured in terms of these three base units meters kilograms and seconds so an example of this is the Newton. The Newton is a measurement of force. It describes, say I'm pushing an object, the way that we can have, like measure how hard I'm pushing is with the unit Newton, named after Isaac Newton, of course. So um, for example, Newton can be written as kilogram times meter squared over seconds squared. And if you go into the unit analysis, which I'm going to discuss shortly, um, if you go into the unit analysis, you'll see that you can even prove that this is an existing um, unit, like conversion, or whatever you want to call it. So and if we want to define these three base units pretty simply, then we can say length is the distance between two points in space, A and B. Mass is the measure of the amount of matter in an object, right? And time is a measurable period that defines the progression of events from past to present to future. I wanted to give a little bit of a definition, but I'm sure you guys already know what time is, of course. All right, and speaking of unit analysis, let's go right into it. Unit analysis is a method of keeping track of units and it, it can often serve as a method of checking our calculations. So an example of this is, um, let's see, if we're dealing with, say we're working with Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. You're going to see this a lot in your class if you haven't already taken the physics course. If we want to double check what, if we want to check 
this, we want to double check that this is in fact the correct unit conversion, then all we need to do is the unit analysis of this formula since force is defined as newtons. So all we do is we take force, we put these little symbols around it, and then we basically break down um, the units of the formula. So we have newtons on one side equal to what mass, which I just said we can define as kilograms, we, we use kilograms to measure mass, times acceleration. And as we go through um, this, the many chapters of mechanics, we're, you're going to get used to this, but acceleration is defined as um, a change of velocity over time. So basically, we're going to have velocity, which is, or you, I guess you could call it speed, now that we're just like warming ourselves up. So it's, which is basically mat length over time, a distance over time. And then we're gonna add another S to it, which makes it squared. Maybe it's a little bit complicated. As we get into the review, you'll probably understand it a little bit better. So that's that. And as you see, these match. They're written a little bit differently, but they are equal. Therefore, we have, we found a method of um, double checking our units. And we call this unit analysis. All right. Um, all right. Next, we can maybe do a little, very, very, very simple problem regarding conversions. So basically taking one unit, well, finding an answer, and then changing that answer from one unit to another. Because you can measure length, mass, time in different ways. You can say 60 seconds ago something happened, or you can say one minute ago something happened. There are many different ways of quantifying measurements. Or of use, there's many different units that we can use to measure anything, basically. So this in this example, I am asking you to calculate the volume of a cylinder. Here's the context. A cylinder has a base radius r, which is equal to 2.5 feet and a height of h equal to 6 feet. Question A is asking to calculate the volume. The volume of the cylinder in cubic feet. Okay. Um, so basically, if you remember what the formula for the volume of a cylinder is, it's pretty simple actually. It's basically the area of the base, I can write it over here, volume of the cylinder is equal to the area of the base times the height. Let me not confuse that with a b. Area of the base times the height. And so if you think about what the area of the base is, well basically we have a circle over here. So it's basically pi r squared times h. And what do you know? We have radius and we have height. Therefore we can just plug in our numbers I R, which is 2.5 feet. For this example, I'm going to write the units inside the formula. Squared times height, which is 6 feet. All right? And if we plug that really quickly into our calculator, we will see 
pi times 2.5 squared times 6 is equal to 117.8097245. I added a lot of a lot of decimals, which is not necessary. Um, but ask your professor about it. Some professors have different standards. We're not working with significant figures over here. We'll only work with significant figures in labs. So what about the, the units though? They're asking for feet cube. Well, here we have feet squared times feet. And what do you know? That's feet cubed. Wow, that's great. Okay, so we have our answer. Now, the next question is asking us to convert convert the volume to SI units. The volume to SI units. And so we, this is finally like an application of what we just went over. What, what do we remember? We remember that mass its SI unit is the kilogram. We know that times, that the SI unit for time is seconds, and we know that the SI unit for length is the meter. It's just like a little reminder. So the way that we're gonna convert this is by using conversion ratios. So if we know that we have feet cubed, and we want to end up with the alternative to feet cubed, which in SI units would be meters cubed, then we need to find the conversion ratio between feet and meters. So we're, I'm actually going to just look that up. I'm not very used to using feet. Feet to meters. So in one foot, we have 0 0.3048 meters. And that could have been written in the other way too. But we're gonna work with it in this way because that's what first came up on the internet. One foot, 0 0.3048. So we take our result. Let's see if you guys can see. Yeah, it's pretty visible. Seven, two, four, five feet cube times, oh, what was it, 0 0.3, we want meters to be on top, yeah, so it was just double checking, 3048 meters per foot, and you might ask yourself, wait, Noah, we, this is feet cubed, and here we only have feet, so if we multiply these two fractions, considering that there's a one underneath here as the denominator. If we multiply, we're only gonna, we're gonna have feet squared times meters, which is not what we want. So what we need to do is actually cube this fraction, this conversion ratio. In that, that way, we'll have feet cubed and meters cubed. These will cross out and we'll have meters cubed as a result. So when we do that, we end up with 3.336 meters cubed, of course, because we're dealing with a volume. So it's three dimensional. Okay, well, fantastic. We have our result. And that's an example, a very brief example of conversion ratios. You're going to deal with these a good bit in physics. Well, usually we want to, usually the problem will already give you the SI units because the emphasis is more on the how rather than these little meticulous changes of units. It's, that's not what we're trying to, that's not what professors are trying to test you with. They're trying to find out if you actually know, know how to apply formulas, not change units. Something that's a little less, a little more casual. Okay. We will now move on to our next section, chapter one.
which is measurement errors. Measurement errors. I can only find my ruler. Okay, there we go. Oh, I'm out of ink almost. That's too bad. All right. So, measurement errors. Um, one very, very important idea to consider in physics and in any science is that all measurements are subject to error. If I'm going to try to measure how long this, this eraser is, I will put my ruler up to it, say that this will be 0, 0.0, and we, so we put 0 centimeters along with it, and then we can see how long it is, right? So we're, we end up with about 12, a bit more than 12 centimeters. But the thing is that we don't know how we can never be sure about our me measurement, like exactly down to the very decimal. Sure, we know that it's above 12. It's very clearly above 12 for me. Maybe it's a little bit difficult to see, but we don't know exactly what to, like to what decimal do we have to go to be sure that we have the exact measurement. We'll never be able to perfectly measure anything except for whole entities like this. This is one eraser. If I had another, there would be two erasers. Those aren't things that I don't measure those with tools. Those are like, they're very visible. Maybe it's a little bit simple to see, but yeah, when you're measuring anything with a tool or even with your eye, if you're, you're trying to guess how long this is, you'll never have a perfect measurement. Thus, all measurements are subject to error. And so ideally, every measurement should be reported as a measured measured value. Oh, we're really running out of ink. Plus or minus an error value. By adding this, we're basically considering we're accepting the fact that our measurement will not necessarily be perfect and that there will actually it will never be perfect. There's always going to be a certain amount of error and certainty in our measurement. So an example, say we have a block of something that we're trying to measure and we have a ruler. Three, bang, okay. Three, okay, now forget about these measurements. Just, they're just considered just to be a ruler. And let's say, actually, let's, let's consider the measurements, the little measurements, the increments. Let's say that this is one inch, two inch, three inches, four inches, five inches, okay. So the length of this box, we, a proper way to report this value would be as such. The length is equal to three plus or minus 0 0.5 inches. So basically we're finding the smallest the smallest increment, which is one inch, we divide that by two, and thus we find our error value. Otherwise, the only me measurement that we can be certain of, the measured value, is three, right? Because there's no, there aren't any measurements in between three and four, so we can't be sure of um, such a measurement. And with this way of noting, measurements, we basically um, are considering how many significant figures we want to add to the number, right? 
So, and I'm going to explain that right now. So, significant figures. Significant figures. These are basically the digits that carry meaningful contributions to the measurement's resolution. And that might sound a little bit daunting. You might be asking, like, what, what does that mean? Well, the number of significant figures indicates the accuracy of a measurement. Um, so it basically helps us determine how, how accurate a scientist was while he was measuring something, depending on if he was using a very good tool or if he was using his eye to determine the length of an object, which is very imprecise. Uh, inaccurate. I mean. So, um, an example for significant figures would be the following. To write, to write the number in scientific notation, something that we're going to use quite a bit, especially in labs, not as much in actual theory, right? Um, so, if we have 237.094, if we want to write this number in scientific notation, we're going to want to have um, the decimal point over here. So, 2.37094 and then we're going to multiply by 10 to the something to the x and in this case it will be 2 since we there's two we, we moved the decimal point by two places to the left meaning there's a hundred that should be added to this number or should that should be multiplied so this is equal to that and that's scientific notation and usually we use scientific notation to determine how many significant figures we have in a number in this situation we have one two three four five six significant figures so six s f right um and in other situations where we have zeros such as this zeros not in the middle of the number but rather before the number or after the number like this well, hold on. let me just deal with this first example if we have zeros that are that precede the other numbers then we actually do not consider these ones these ones are are not considered in the significant uh, they're not considered as significant figures and the reason being is that these just determine how far away from well just like what position these numbers fall in basically saying that these 38 is not just it's not 38 this is um it's a very 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 small number instead like if it was if we just wrote 38 that would be much larger than this and the zeros just help us um figure out how small this number is right on the other hand if we had 4000 these numbers are important because if we put this into um scientific notation it would be written as 4.000 times 10 to the negative 3 10 times to the 3 Right? So you see these numbers could have been other numbers if they were not significant, but they aren't. Or, and also, if these weren't significant numbers, then we wouldn't have written them here. Yeah. Um, same thing goes for this. We can also write this as 3.8 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, negative 3. Right? But we don't. Well, actually, oh no, what am I saying? We do. Oh, we should. It's a better way of writing them, especially if we're considering significant figures. Got something going on over here. I'll ignore that for now. Okay. 
And when, we, when we're using measurement errors, we actually have a way of determining how many significant figures there are in a number. And allow me to explain. If we have, say, a length of a road, and the length of the road is measured to be 1,500 meters, depending on the error value, we will have a way of knowing how many significant figures we have in the number. So say if this was 1500 plus or minus 100, and I'm going to remove the unit and add it to the end. If we had this, meaning um, this is pretty inaccurate, Let, let's call this like someone just eyeballing um, the road to just guess how long it is. So if we, if we eyeball it and we end up with this much um, uncertainty, then we basically have to understand that this number could, either, could go all the way down to 1400 or go all the way up to 1600, right? That's what this is saying. It, the number, the actual measurement is somewhere in between these two numbers, but we'll never find out what, where exactly. And because we are, we can't be certain of these two digits, like what they will be, we're absolutely, we have no idea. These could, this could be one through nine, this could be one through nine. Well then, these are not significant figures. On the other hand, the five, though one might say that, oh, it can be four, five, or six. Well, we've actually trimmed the crowd. We, we have an idea, we have, we know that it's either between, it's either four, five, or six, meaning it's somewhat certain. So that will be the first of our significant figures. So this situation we have, this could be written as, as such, um, the three meters. So we basically have two significant figures. If we wrote this as 1500 plus or minus 10 meters, then we're dealing with a bit of a different situation. We know that the 1500, the, the 1 and the 5 will always stay the same. The 0 will either be, well actually, the 1 will always stay the same. The, fi the 5 can either be a 5 or a 4. And then the 0 will either be a 1 or a 9. Right? Um, well actually, it can also be a 0 if it's exactly on the spot. But basically, this, this, this is basically how far it can reach. These are like the limits. It can either go up by one or go down by one. And because of that, we have an idea of what this number can be. It can be as small as 1490 and as high as 1510. Therefore, we have an idea for these three numbers. So we have three significant figures. And if we follow this pattern, if we were to say that someone measured the road with a one meter inaccuracy, then, well, error value, then we would have this. This being four significant figures, which is an excellent measurement, I, I would say at least. All right, um, let's see. Yeah, so in our lecture, basically every single other video I will be making, we will not really be concerned by error, measurement errors, because they take up a little bit too much time and they're a little bit off like the point of physics, well at least in the class, which will be just to learn the concepts and apply them properly in every problem. And I would say that one good, two good, rules for like our lecture will be to round off only at the end of the calculation to make sure that we have as like the numbers that we have are as legitimate as possible and we'll actually try to keep at least three decimal places in that answer one final thing that we're going to go over in chapter one is mass density which starts to this is starting to be a topic that we will be dealing with much later in chapter 10. Mass density. 
mass density is basically um, basically allows us to describe it describes the amount of mass of mass in a given region region of space. Without a doubt, you've already heard of this idea. Basically, something that's, you've probably um, already dealt with the situation. If you have something that's very dense, and you throw it in the pool, it will sink because its density is higher than the water. Um, on the other hand, if you have something that's not very dense, it will actually float on the water because its density isn't as high. Um, so basically what that means, and if, if you're familiar with that idea, density has nothing to do with how big an object is. We can have a small cube of metal, which has higher density than a big cloud of cotton candy because there's a lot of air in this and this is a lot more compact and metal generally has a higher density. So, um, and we can call this cotton candy, I guess. Candy. And the way that we write mass density, at least in terms of volume, volume mass density is with this letter, which is rho. And we can say that this one of M is larger than P, a rho of C. Rho of M is larger than rho of C. But anyways, it's basically a density, mass density is a ratio that connects usually volume and mass. And this definition just says region of space, and you're gonna see why in a second. But basically, um, amount of mass, that's our kilogram, right? And a given amount of space, you might be tempted to just say meters cubed, but actually it can be meters, meters squared, or meters cubed. And we're going to see how right now. Um, so basically we have three different types of mass density. We have the length mass density, mass density, which is, which, let me just write, draw this. Then we have the area, mass density. Mass density. Next, we have the volume mass density, which is something that everyone is more familiar with. Let me just draw something so that we can understand this a little bit better. This is a plate, and here we'll have a little volume, little block of something. Let's call that a brick, maybe. All right. So basically, in every situation, for every given region of space, for this portion of space, there is a certain amount of mass, right? And that mass is not necessarily the same everywhere in this plate. One side of the plate might be constructed of a material that's much more, well, no, actually, let's say it's constructed of the same material everywhere. It might be more compact and dense in certain areas, though it doesn't show in its volume. It's very, very thin, but very heavy. And the other side might be very light, as though there's little mass. There's no mass and in a given, in a large volume, right? And that applies in all three scenarios. In this scenario, this looks like just a, a line, but, and it is a line, but there could be a large amount of mass here. I guess let's put arrow up mass. And then over here, low mass. And over here, let's say this low mass as well. Let's say that this is very heavy and then here is lower, is it a little lighter, lighter and lighter, right? So that's basically how we define um, 
density in anything, mass density. It's just that these different scenarios are just for different dimensions. Here we have one, a 1D situation, here we have a 2D situation, here we have a 3D situation. In this situation, we're, we're basically dealing with like a paper, reef, a paper um, as seen from the side. I'll just grab one really quick. If you look at a sheet of paper, it's very thin from the side. And though pieces of paper are equally dense everywhere, I would suppose, um, we can imagine that on one side, there's more mass than the other, despite there being, despite it just being like a line and not more, not having more space on one side or the other, right? And this can go, this can also work for like, no, actually this cannot work for that. Or can it? No, 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 this can, I, hmm. No, we'll just deal with one line, actually. No, this could work for this too, like a squiggly line. Um, yeah, it would work as well. Um, for mass density, would that work? No, actually, I don't think so. Not 1D, I'm sorry. Area, mass density, it's the same concept, but we're dealing with a plate, and here we're dealing with a volume. And the reason I'm talking about this is because we have a way of um, just deriving mass from these different, from equations that define the mass density of a line, a plate, or a solid. Here, the equation that we use to define a ma length, mass, length mass density is this little symbol. To be honest, I don't know what it is called. Like this. Alright. And so, what we find out, what we're going to use as a formula is this. DL. If we take the integral of this equation with respect to length, then we basically obtain the mass of this object. Same goes here, except for it's the integral of yet another equation. And this is going to be d of a. And finally, we have mass is equal to the integral of rho this one I know, dv. And these basically allow us to take an equation of mass density, whether it be in 1D, 2D, or 3D, and obtain a mass. And that basically sums up chapter one. Thank you so much for watching. See you guys next time.